Good morning, everyone. I, I see by my clock that we're at the top of the hour, 11 o'clock, and uh, welcome to the latest in Natural Gas World's Canadian Gas Dialogues webinar series, Pandemic Edition. We're just waiting on uh, Jeffrey Tonkin from Birchcliff Energy. Uh, he will uh, get here, I'm hoping, in, in time to join us. In the meantime, uh, I'd like to introduce you to our moderator. This morning, Dulles Wang uh, is Wood McKenzie's Director of North American Gas Research, which he's been since he joined Woodmac in 2013. Uh, at Woodmac, he's in charge of uh, developing uh, short term and long term uh, supply and demand forecasts and also examining market dynamics for the natural gas sector here in Canada. He's a smart guy, he's got a couple of degrees, one's from Johns Hopkins and another from MIT, so uh, he's far more suited to this than I am, so I'll turn things over to Dulles. Dulles? All right, thank you very much, Del. You're, you're way too kind. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, we've got a fantastic lineup of speakers, um, industry heavyweights in Western Canada, and we'll introduce them indiv individually before their um, their, their session. Um, but just to, I think, get everything started, um, as you guys know, we've been uh, watching for, you know, price collapse in both oil and gas over the last couple of months. Uh, and... And the good thing is, you know, ACO prices this year has been relatively strong compared to, to the previous years over the last couple of years. Um, but the pretty um, dark, I guess the, the fact right now that we're watching for is just production this year is expected to decline. And we saw production pull back in 2019 as well. Um, so the consecutive years of, you know, production decline in Western Canada really makes us question, you know, do we have enough running room uh, in Western Canada for the low cost supply that we have, you know, whether it's because of, you know, we're drilling out, out of those core areas or are we competing well against some of the other basins? Um, that's something that I think we're watching for right now uh, and just exactly how the producers will be able to weather the storm, um, you know, with the low commodity prices we've seen in a couple of years. Um, and when do we expect to see Basin uh, returning to the growth? But today, um, I think we will probably cover this from all aspects um, of, you know, the, the Canadian upstream, looking at the resource, looking at ways that we can uh, somehow get the resource to market in possible ways. And then we are lucky enough to, to be joined with um, Darren and um, Jeff later on to hear the operator's perspective on how we can weather the storm and return the basin or return to the growth mode that we, we saw in the last couple of years. So just to start out, uh, I will probably hand this over. So I will hand this over to Brad, um, the the president um, of the the Petro the the, the Petrol um, Robinson um, Group, and uh, he will give us uh, an up an update on the resource that we're seeing in Western Canada. So Brad, um, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Th thanks very much, Dulles. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks for inviting me to join. If I could get my first slide up, please. Uh, I've just got a few slides that I'd like to talk to. And what I'm going to be addressing today is uh, just from the very beginning of looking at our gas resources available to us in Western Canada. So uh, we know that through the development of unconventional uh, uh, oil and gas, and particular gas in Western Canada through uh, horizontal drilling hydraulic fracturing over the last number of years that we've tapped into an immense, uh, very large resource base and we keep hearing huge numbers. But I think it's good to have a bit of a reminder of what's behind these numbers, where the gas resources are. And I think once, uh, once Dan and I have talked uh, uh, at sort of the high scale on these uh, gas resources, we'll turn it over to uh, our colleagues from the producing companies that will maybe temper our optimism a little bit and tell us about the practicalities of actually producing these resources. So um, if I could see my first slide up, please, I'd, I want to go to that. And I'm not seeing it, so we'll just hang on a sec here. OK, 
Okay, well, while well, we're uh, waiting, <laughs> we're waiting for that slide to pop up. I'll, uh, I'll wave my arms a little bit then. Uh, really, my first slide is going to uh, show where we've got uh, uh, shale gas, unconventional gas resources in Western Canada. And of course, these days we think very largely about uh, uh, about the Deep Basin and the Montney and the Duvernay, which are the the uh, parts of the basin or the basins that are getting the most press. And certainly these are uh, extremely Im impressive resources. And again, we'll hear a bit more about those in a few minutes, uh, the actual production of them. Uh, and uh, there are some very large volumes associated with those particular basins, but we don't want to forget that there's uh, a, a bunch of other, um, a bunch of other gas resources behind those. So, um, is anybody else seeing my maps or is it they're just not there yet? No. Hmm. Uh, Dale, are we able to get that uh, first slide of mine up, please? Maybe it's just us three now. <laughs> no, it says there's a there. So there's some people here watching us. So, um, so I'll, uh, I'll keep going, hoping that that pops up in the middle here. Uh, although I'm kind of visually cued, so I'm going to have to try to remember everything. But uh, as I said, what I'll point out in the map is that the, uh, uh, the Deep Basin area, for example, is our first real unconventional gas uh, uh, fairway in Western Canada. In fact, way back in the uh, late 70s and early 80s, it began being developed uh, uh, through uh, Canadian Hunter, Texaco, Imperial were some of the first companies in that area and I had the privilege of working with Canadian Hunter for a number of years uh, drilling gas wells in the BC side of the uh, of the Deep Basin and it's a it's a huge resource uh, it hasn't been quantified as as uh, precisely I guess as some of the other uh, plays like the Duvernay and the Montney because it's such a heterogeneous collection of different reservoirs. I know that uh, uh, Darren can tell us a lot about uh, some of those reservoirs like the Cardium and the Spirit River uh, formation, uh, but we've got uh, deep basin gas resources all the way down into the uh, upper part of the, the Jurassic section in the Dunleavy and Buick Creek and up through uh, the Cardium. There's a uh, at least uh, 10 or 15 different formations in there and cumulatively the gas in place in those formations has been added up to uh, the most recent number I saw is about 440 trillion cubic feet of gas in place on the Alberta side. Uh, I haven't seen an overall quantification of deep base and gas in place on the BC side but it's an immense resource. By comparison, uh, the, the Montney Formation, which of course is uh, at the top of just about everybody's mind, is a, is a massive gas resource that's a, a very thick formation, very extensively distributed across uh, Alberta and northeastern British Columbia, has some very high pressure areas with high liquids content, but the, the gas resource assessed to it by the NEB in joint cooperation with the BC OGC and the Alberta Geological Survey, uh, I think was on the order of 449 trillion cubic feet of gas. And that's uh, their that's their marketable estimate, not their... <laughs> well, thank you, Dan. <laughs> that's their marketable estimate. In fact, good reminder, Dan, I actually have the presentation here myself, so I'm just going to get it up here to, uh, to kind of cue myself to remember what I'm talking about. Um, so uh, I'll try to do that anyway. Yeah, so 449 TCF of gas in the Montney Formation Fairway. Uh, the Deep Basin, as I said, has more than 500 TCF of gas in place. Uh, the Duvernay Shale, and all three of these, of course, are in West Central Alberta and up into Northeastern BC, also has a marketable gas estimate of about 77 trillion cubic feet. Uh, although a lot of the effort in the Duvernay is more focused towards oil and liquids production. So those are, uh, those are resources that are relatively close at hand. They're being developed. They're tied in. Uh, the uh, producers, as we're going to hear from uh, later in this uh, webinar, have a very good idea of perhaps how much of that marketable gas is truly economic to put on stream. There we go. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, 
let me I'll just back up a sec. So what I was talking about here was the uh, with the deep basin, the Duvernay and the Montagne. and you can see them along the Alberta BC border right in the middle there. I do want to also uh, make sure people remember that we've got other big resources around there as in the Williston Basin, primarily associated gas with some of the oil plays and basins up to the north. Could I have the next slide, please? Thank you. And so, as I was just saying there, that here are the uh, resources associated with the Montney Fairway, uh, the Deep Basin in the red uh, ellipse there, and the Duvernay and kind of the magenta color off to the right. So these are the basins that are uh, producing the Deep Basin since the 70s, the, uh, the Montney since about 2005, the Duvernay uh, unconventionally since about 2010 or so. So we're, we've got great gas resources in these basins, they're tied in and they're producing. And they are capable of much greater production rates with further development as a new demand, particularly LNG comes on stream. Could I get the next slide, please? Thank you. Uh, and to say, I just wanted to remind people that while we're focused on the southerly basins uh, at the moment because they're in, in our infrastructure and on stream, there are huge resources, primarily further to the north, that have been discovered and delineated to some extent, uh, but are not currently tied in uh, because basically the access isn't economical. So the Horn River Basin, you probably remember, was dis, uh, discovered as a shale play back in about 2005, 2006, and there was a fair bit of drilling that demonstrated very, very highly productive dry gas wells, and some of this has been tied in but uh, development of Horn River shales has been very limited in the last few years, simply because the gas is so dry, there's no liquids upside, and, uh, and they're more or less blowing down what they've got. Uh, shortly after the Horn River was discovered, the Liard Basin to the west, and kind of a light blue there, uh, again, uh, very large marketable gas resources, uh, about half of those that the Montney has, uh, very few wells into it, and, and maybe one or two of them tied in, uh, but again, that, that's further from market, drier gas, but it's an immense resource that's sitting back there. Finally, just to finish off, if we look up in the Northwest Territories, in the central Mackenzie Valley, uh, the sort of orangey color here, uh, there has been uh, a, uh, some activity back in the 2012-2015 range. Uh, companies were hoping that they would be able to produce oil from the Horn River and uh, Canal Shales uh, in the area. Uh, unfortunately, the, the activity to date has really proven up only the, uh, the, uh, some gas, which I guess from the point of view of development isn't fortunate. It is another probably very large gas resource, but it is very far from market. I mean, there's no infrastructure to produce that gas to north of the very, uh, very southern part of the Yukon and Northwest Territories. And I don't want to forget the immense gas resource, the Beaufort Mackenzie, the Colville Hills, and other conventional areas in uh, in northern Canada. So my one more slide, please, and I'll that'll be my last one. So just to put that in perspective, uh, the pre-COVID gas production, and Dulles mentioned that this was falling off, was about 16 BCF a day or 5.9 TCF a year, according to the last NEB stats that I saw. And of course, that gas production has come from legacy conventional gas reservoirs, as well as our newer unconventionals, with the unconventionals taking a more important role all the time. Our gas drilling in recent years has been greatly restricted by market issues, uh, but the point that I want to conclude with is that Canadian marketable gas resources greatly exceed 100 years of supply at the current rates of production, and we can certainly accelerate that production quite drastically with the development room we've got, but uh, the questions of economics and infrastructure access are very important ones that I think my colleagues following are going to expand upon. So thanks very much, and uh, over back to you, Dulles. All right, thank you very much, Brad. I think that was really helpful to go over, you know, some of the where the production has been taking place, activity has been taking place, and what we have um, in, um, you know, in 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 the backyard. Where if going out 15, 20 years, we still have a lot of res uh, resources uh, to drill. Um, but as Brad alluded to, you know, we do have a lot of issues in terms of um, access to, to new markets uh, that we saw uh, in the last couple of years. And um, we have actually seen the LNG industry taking 
um, you know, starting to 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 pick up, uh, and we've seen developments moving forward with the LNG Canada project. And just yesterday, I think we saw the announcement that per Paraday has engaged with Bechtel uh, for the project on the east. So this would be a great opportunity to uh, bring on Dan uh, Dan Allen, the the president of Uber. Um, yeah, this right is the Canadian Society for Unconventional Resources to talk about you know, market access and even the LNG issues that he's been seeing. Thank you, Dallas. Everyone can hear me. Thanks uh, to the committee and uh, uh, to the uh, group here for putting on this great webinar. So, next slide, please. So, as Brad alluded to, um, a key component for discussing shale gas running room is do we have the resource? And the answer is yes. Do we have the ability to convert that resource into reserves? And the answer is yes. We have the technology and the expertise in Calgary, um, unlike almost any other energy sector or any energy uh, center in the world. Um, what is missing in the Canadian story is market, and market being defined by having a demand and a demand at an acceptable price. Um, as Dallas alluded to, for decades, Canada's market was the United States, and that was a great market to be accessing because they had an inexhaustible demand for energy up until about 2010. That's when the uh, shale gas revolution took over. Um, a shameless plug for CSER is we were the technical teams behind the shale gas revolution, developing the technologies to drill horizontal wells and multi-stage fracturing. Um, the result of success was that the U.S. gas supply increased by over 50 billion cubic feet a day over the last decade. Uh, therefore, backing out, if you will, can need for Canadian gas. So that leads to the discussion of what should Canada do with its immense resources? And the answer to us in the industry and to a lot of people was, let us utilize our abundant, uh, clean natural gas supply, which is the cleanest of all hydrocarbon sources, to help us through the energy transition as we uh, move from a high carbon fuels to lower carbon fuels and ultimately a zero carbon fuels. So the belief was that in order to continue to prosper with our natural gas resources, we needed to develop global markets. And in order to access global markets for a substance like natural gas requires LNG, the ability to liquefy the, the commodity. Canada needed to access global markets Hence, CSER undertook a project um, called Advancing Canada's LNG Narrative. So as I show on this slide, the belief that Canada should be a major new industry of Canada resonated across the energy sector throughout the last four to five years. Uh, we have the resource, we have the technology, and our belief is in a post-COVID world, uh, rebuilding the economy should emphasize, strongly emphasize, uh, developing Canada's uh, low GHG emitting natural gas uh, resource. So in May, we released the final report on our Advancing Canada's LNG narrative. This narrative was a project that was developed by CSER and the government of Alberta, and it was to communicate the value of that natural gas in our country and the ability to transfer from natural gas into LNG and supply it globally, both uh, to a global market. Next slide, please. So as part of this one-year program, uh, our organization released four special reports. We did this in conjunction with our partners at JWN Energy. Uh, Dale will know them very well also. Um, we covered in those special reports such important topics like uh, environment and technology around LNG production and the investment required to stimulate an LNG industry. 
market access and First Nations engagement was a critical component in one of our reports, and then global trade. We also prepared 15 very focused special articles that were distributed throughout the business community and to the public at large um, on LNG, on various uh, parts of the uh, value chain, if you will. And then we accompanied those reports with actual uh, on the ground meetings with our communities. We did six regional events throughout uh, Canada um, and, and globally, uh, including Vancouver, Toronto, Calgary, Fort St. John, London, and Tokyo. And then finally, we did four local, if you will, uh, events uh, targeting the Alberta and British Columbia markets predominantly, but those were held in Red Deer, Olds, Edmonton, and Grand Prairie. Next slide, please. So after engaging extensively with the business community, with all the stakeholders and with government, both in Canada and globally, uh, we came up with some recommendations in the study. And those recommendations were tabled to the Alberta government as well as our industry partners. And we had strong collaboration, by the way, with both the BC government and the federal government all the way through this initiative, which is really important because it allowed us to have the ability to com continually communicate with those partners as we continue to work through COVID and still stimulate a natural gas industry. Uh, our recommendations was that LNG and the LNG opportunity here pr provides a great global narrative on ESG and the ESG uh, attempts by corporations, not attempts, but, but the focus, I should say, on attempting to have the, the best ESG metrics in the world. And it fits very nicely into the energy transition theme that we see happening globally, trying to transition to the lowest carbon types of energy. We were also successful in raising grassroots awareness with communities on understanding exactly what LNG means, how we go about it, how we actually prevent environmental issues by being very proactive. These meetings were very, very uh, beneficial. They provided a great information sharing and a great conduit for people that had in interests and questions to contact us and get more information. An example of that was, for example, a group called Synergy Alberta, which represents about seven or eight different uh, oil and gas producing areas across the province where stakeholders have gone together to send up these synergy groups and they invited us to their annual meeting as well as several of the local meetings to explain exactly what this new industry could mean to them. Uh, finally, uh, a big component of the study was the supply benefit chain that would accrue to our country uh, and to all its communities should we have a very robust LNG industry. And it was immense. We did some uh, information sharing on some of the economic analysis that were done by ourselves with PSAC and also Siri, showing the significant value add to our economy from a robust LNG industry. And lastly, um, obviously in this very distressed time for the industry, um, this type of activity would be more than welcome to the service and supply sector for our industry. Next slide. Uh, lastly, uh, we want to continue to broadcast the Canadian advantages nationally and globally. I can underemphasize this. Uh, we're seeing a, a very fragmented country right now with its awareness on energy issues. And I think it's critical that we continue uh, to engage with uh, locations such as Ottawa, Toronto, and uh, Quebec City, and Halifax on how the natural gas industry and specifically LNG fits the ESG narrative, fits the energy transition narrative, and strongly supports uh, partnerships with First Nations. Uh, we also clearly defined the role that LNG would play towards Canada meeting its energy transition targets for both 2030 and, and the net zero targets of 2050. And lastly, we established some great uh, connections and engagement with key governments across uh, the country, uh, specifically uh, federal, provincial, and, and regional, as well as some of the governments in uh, places like Japan and uh, the UK. 
And we did so because our organization is not a political organization, not a lobbyist organization, organization, but it is a, we are a true strategic partner trying to share the same goals and aspirations to develop uh, our country. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, and it's great to know that there are groups like CSER um, that are helping to unlock markets and also push, you know, the Canadian LNG industry forward um, to help unlock more of our resources. But next, let's turn our focus back to our basin uh, because at the end of the day, we need the gas production to help feed these LNG projects. Um, and our next speaker, um, Darren G. I don't think he needs any more introduction. Uh, I am actually an avid reader of the President's Monthly Report. So um, I think the key here for, for Darren, and hopefully you can give us more, and just, I guess, uh, more of your insights on, you know, how things are happening in the basin, because over the last couple of years, we did see a shift in drilling uh, in the basin away from deep basin commodity for some producers. Um, but, you know, in the last couple of months, we continue to see more activity coming uh, you know, uh, increasing in the deep basin region. So maybe you could, you know, pivot on the experience, you know, with Pato being one of the top operators in the deep basin to share, you know, is, do we still see or expect more efficiency gains from this relatively mature basin? Um, are there ways to unlock more running room uh, for deep basin? Yeah, thanks, Phyllis. Um, and that's, uh, you know, a great intro into the problem that we have. We definitely don't have a a resource problem, as Brad alluded to, there's enormous amounts of natural gas resources in Western Canada. Uh, some of the plays we're working on, like the Deep Basin and the Montney, we're actively drilling those today. Um, some of the plays we're not even working on, really, that we need to get to at some point. And all of this, obviously, with a goal that uh, we can share our uh, environmentally responsible, developed natural gas with the rest of the world through, hopefully, LNG exports. Uh, we're very close on the Western side of the country to the coastline of BC and to, uh, to Asian markets, which makes LNG exports very logical. Um, maybe just, uh, if I can flip to the next slide, just give you a quick uh, introduction of PEDO. We've been operating now in the Alberta Deep Basin for 21 years, which is a long time for any company. In fact, um, we started out as a, just a little junior and we're actively drilling up the basin, um, working with our cash flow. You know, we didn't uh, really tap into a lot of external uh, funding, which is a good thing to know because uh, today there isn't a lot of external funding for the industry, either in the form of bank support or uh, in the form of new equity capital coming in. And uh, one of the things I think we do have to recognize as an industry is that if we're going to grow the basin in a material way to access these resources, to be able to export them and share them with the rest of the world, we are going to have to have additional capital to use to do that. Um, just with the cash flows that are coming out of the basin today, I, I don't think that's sufficient to actually grow the basin in a material way. And yet that's something we all want to see happen is, uh, is these natural gas resources developed and shared with the rest of the world because we see that as a logical thing uh, in the energy transition going forward. So we've been in the basin for quite a while, uh, 21 years, uh, actively drilling it up. One of the advantages of the basin, of course, is that it has big resources in place. There's long reserve life assets. Uh, of course, one of the disadvantages is it's a relatively tight uh, rock that has to be fractured. We have to use this new horizontal multi-stage frac technology really to unlock a lot of it. Um, it requires infrastructure. It's not uh, necessarily uh, underneath a whole lot of existing infrastructure. So as the industry has been developing, we've also been adding new gas plants and pipelines and We've uh, discovered that the Nova gas system that services this uh, basin obviously has been tight in terms of its capacity over the last couple of years. And so we've run into bottlenecks and that has caused big price disconnections too. And so we've had to get through a lot of that uh, turbulence uh, over the last few years as we develop the basin. Maybe uh, if we could just jump to slide four, just to give you though an illustration, um, uh, Pato uh, is, drilled now a thousand horizontal wells over the last decade in the deep basin. It's a lot of drilling, quite frankly, and a lot of activity. We talk about uh, how much resource is there to be developed, but it requires a lot of drilling to get to it. Um, like I said, we've been the most active driller in the deep basin 
uh, with a thousand wells, horizontal wells, over the last decade, uh, more than any other guy. And uh, you know, there's been a lot of drilling in the basin. Uh, the Montney has seen similar type of activity, and I'm sure Jeff can allude to uh, the type of activity it's seen over the last few years. But all this resource doesn't get just developed overnight. It requires a ton of rigs at work and, and a lot of capital uh, to, to develop. Uh, the next slide just shows uh, the resource that we've uh, proven up and uh, discovered over the last uh, 20 years. If we can advance to that next slide, Lee. Um, you know, we, we spend about $6 billion uh, discovering about 6.75 TCF of resource. Uh, Brad was talking about uh, the Deep Basin offering 400 TCF plus of resource, and I think that's kind of the numbers that have been tossed around in the Montney. So there is an enormous resource out there, but uh, you've got to drill a lot of wells to develop just a little bit of it. And so we need uh, a, a lot of activity going on. We need a lot of drilling rigs, uh, busy drilling, and we need a lot of capital to fund all of that. Uh, and then it boils down really to pricing, doesn't it? It really boils down to what kind of commodity price can we achieve? And is that commodity price sufficient to, uh, to drive this kind of activity? You know, over the last uh, 21 years that pato has been active in the deep basin, I think our average gas price realized is about $4.80 uh, an MCF. And so when we look at the futures strip today, do we have that kind of price on the horizon? Not really. Uh, we've got probably a $2.50 price uh, staring us in the face for the near future. And so is that sufficient really to get out there and develop those hundreds of TCF of resource that we have in the basins uh, that we can, uh, you know, get our hands on and that we hope to develop and share with the rest of the world. Um, it really is commodity price dependent. And today, as I mentioned, companies are really just dealing with their cash flows. And so our basin has been unable to really show a lot of growth uh, with the cash flow that's coming off of the commodity prices that we've had over the last few years. So I think, it, you know, really the driver is going to be the demand for natural gas globally. It's going to be demand even within North America. Uh, if those demands continue to grow and there's pricing indicators, uh, positive pricing indicators because of that demand, then Canada and Western Canada have more than enough resources and the technologies to get it out and get it to market. Uh, we are seeing some advancement, at least in the expansion of the gathering systems, the larger pipeline systems that take that gas away to different parts of the market, whether that's in North America or hopefully here to Asia through LNG. And uh, I think, you know, there, the technology exists, the resources exist. Uh, now it's really just a commercial question of, do we have the drivers that are going to cause that growth? Uh, maybe we can just flip a couple more slides ahead. I'll give you just a, an illustration of what Pato is going to be doing with its cash flow over the next couple of years. Uh, Lily, if you can advance to slide six. Um, you know, we've got uh, a cash flow program this year, uh, basically putting all of our cash flow back into the ground, into drilling. Uh, that should result in some uh, growth in our production. Uh, we anticipate over the next couple of years to do the same kind of thing. Uh, we're going to continue to uh, invest our cash flow because that's all we've got to work with. And that should result in some growing production, but it's not a huge growth rate for sure. And I think Jeff can probably uh, echo those same sentiments that if we really want to get after growing this basin, it will require that we have some external capital. And I think that external capital comes when we've got commodity prices that are exciting for investors to look at and uh, exciting for companies to uh, get involved in. Lily, if you could just maybe advance to the, to the last slide. I just wanted to speak briefly, though, about uh, the, the fact that, you know, the narrative today is that uh, you know, maybe oil has a shelf life. Uh, our demand for oil into the future maybe has some limiting factors. Um, and we've got, uh, you know, some other technologies coming and perhaps some other fuels that we might be converting some of these hydrocarbons into. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about blue hydrogen, for instance, uh, using natural gas as a source uh, to develop hydrogen as a fuel so that we can then use that as a transportation fuel that has no emissions associated with it. We transfer then the emissions uh, really from the consumer back to the producers of the energy 
Uh, I think Western Canada is quite well situated actually for that. We've got a lot of methane, we've got a lot of the natural gas feedstock, uh, we've got a lot of infrastructure for transportation, uh, we've got a lot of knowledge even with carbon capture and sequestration and storage. And uh, we've got storage reservoirs across the, the basin. Uh, Pato, for instance, has a big 100 BCF uh, storage reservoir in our big sunny location. Uh, that we could use rather than store natural gas for cycling seasonally, uh, we could use that to store CO2. So, you know, I think um, as an industry, we're quite creative. Uh, I think with these resources, uh, we have uh, the innovation that's required to be able to make them commercial in some form or another, depending on how technology advances into the future and what kind of fuels uh, the world demands. So, um, you know, I think. Uh, whether we're just selling this as methane and maybe liquefying it as LNG and shipping it to the rest of the world, or we're converting it into something like blue hydrogen that can be used as transportation fuel and then sold to uh, North America and the rest of the world. I think uh, Western Canadian natural gas has a very bright future associated with it. So duels, maybe I can uh, pass it off at that point. Yeah, definitely. Um... Thank you very much, Darren. I think that was really helpful. And and we definitely share the sentiment um, at Will McKinsey about just uh, how gas producers have been you know, experiencing a lot of the, the cash crunch over the last couple of years. And now the, and this is not just unique to, to Western Canada, right? Where we saw the same story happening, uh, playing out in, in the Northeast uh, and some of the other basins. Um, so definitely, I think just having that, that the, the capital to come into the basin uh, and possibly driven by the price signals is something that we're, we're, we're gonna have to watch for in the future. Um, and this is actually a really good opportunity to talk to, to bring Jeff uh, into the conversation. Um, Jeff Tunkin, another industry heavyweight, um, chairman, president, and CEO of Birchcliff. Um, and I think it will be great um, to hear, you know, your experience given that how Birchcliff has really pivoted to the, the Montney and Doig over the last couple of years um, and how to, I guess the questions on a lot of people's mind is how do you remain a low cost operator? Um, and also, um, do we see more potentials for for the basin or for Motney um, as you start you know, exploring different benches or if that's still something that, that's in the infant stage, um, you know, to compared to like a Permian example where they're going to multiple dimensions. Um, and are there ways to say extract more value um, to keep our, you know, our basins and our operators um, continue to grow into the future. And well, actually one last thing is, um, it's Jeff has got the presentation, it's got a one pager, um, everybody can download it in the handout section and feel free to ask questions in the questions um, uh, section as well. All right, sorry, Jeff, please go ahead. No, first of all, can you hear me? Yes, that's good, that's a good start. I apologize for being late. I, I was having uh, technical problems. I don't know if that's a reflection of myself and my company. I hope not. But I'm here, I'm alive, and I'm well. And uh, I think Darren is a heavyweight in our industry. I'm a lightweight compared to him. So uh, I'm always very careful when I speak uh, with uh, my other industry peers uh, because I'm very respectful of Darren and his company. I should tell you, I am a large shareholder of his company and I've enjoyed the dividends for a long time. So if anybody's going to cheer for him today, it's me. So uh, I just laid that groundwork. And I uh, wanted to thank Dale for uh, organizing this whole event. I appreciate being part of this. Um, so I, I want to hit on three or four different things because some of the others have hit on it, but I want to emphasize it. Uh, number one, I believe that the Deep Basin and the Montney, um, we have a significant amount of resource in Western Canada, especially in Alberta and British Columbia, to develop a long-term, responsibly produced uh, natural gas, um, build that industry and enlarge that industry and we have the, uh, I believe the ability as an industry and the entrepreneurs that are uh, in Western Canada to develop uh, uh, our own LNG um, solution. And when I say our own LNG solution, I mean 
Alberta operators, British Columbia operators, Canadian based owned companies to go out and develop a, um, our own LNG. And what I mean by our own LNG is I, I mean to put together a project where we can take Western Canadian gas that's produced by Canadians and sold internationally so that we can get the benefit of, of uh, a higher price. So we have the resource in place. I believe the strong companies, and Darren really emphasized that about capital, and there is no capital coming into the industry currently. So the very strong companies have to survive on cash flow. So uh, I think I speak for industry generally, especially because of the COVID downturn uh, in energy prices and the fact that we had uh, Russia and Saudi Arabia killing the oil market in March and April has really stacked up debt on the balance sheets of Canadian producers. And I don't care uh, who you are, um, when oil goes to $5, you can't make a go of it and your cash flows uh, fall materially. So number one, you know, if we'd had this conference in January and oil was $60 and gas was $250, that was one discussion. But when we have it now in October and oil today, you know, call it US $40, um, that has really changed the, the situation with the balance sheets of a lot of oil and gas producers. And it's been, in my view, very, very good for the potential for the future of natural gas by having very weak oil and having oil stay there and that's because um, a lot of natural gas comes from associated production of oil and I don't think there's very many oil producers who can grow their production at $40 US. I think at $30 US um, they're, they're going to sink. At $40 US there's enough to build a lifeboat around your oil business so that uh, you can make some money at, at uh, producing oil, but not enough to flourish and build large companies and have really active drilling programs to grow your oil, which is really good for natural gas. Because when that associated uh, gas is not being produced for oil, that means gas is going to have more value. So I think from a gas perspective, the way this is um, starting to to develop for Pato and ourselves having stronger gas prices is good news but um, the strong companies so the and what I view as very strong companies are companies like Pato and ourselves we own our infrastructure hundred percent we have very focused properties so we know a lot about a specific area we know the people we knew know the services we know the geology and when you have all those things, you can drive your costs down because of focus. And by keeping the economic rent, that's allowed us to survive by not using a lot of third-party processors who take, take um, in a low gas price environment, the economic rent that they take is usually the, the only rent available. So that the only money that you're actually making goes to third-party processors. So when you don't have that, that spread is yours and that's really what's the difference between companies such as ourselves and other natural gas producers. Those who own their own infrastructure are making more money and can survive at low gas prices. And as Darren was commenting, now we think that at, at the future strip prices today, we can flourish. But in the short term, I suspect, and Darren said it as well, we're gonna pay our debt down, we're gonna clean our balance sheets up uh, I know because of the infrastructure that we built this year, um, Birchcliffe is probably going to take on $100 million of debt that we didn't expect that we would take on uh, this year in 2020. So next year we'll run flat and pay our debt down to get that uh, pristine balance sheet back to where it needs to be. Uh, and in fact, we'll probably run flat for two years to clean it up even more than that because I believe the companies who have clean balance sheets have all the optionality to do whatever they want to do with respect to their businesses. So um, if I know that 
the low cost operators have to clean up their balance sheets because we've had low um, uh, commodity prices this past year. That means the high cost operators got real trouble. And uh, that means the strong companies should flourish in this industry. So there's a few other things going on that I think is gonna allow us to, and I wanna really comment uh, back to what Dan was saying about the, the LNG growth or the opportunity because natural gas fits a fits a whole number of buckets from an ESG perspective and clean energy. There's a check mark there. For those who um, want to help, uh, and I and we're very keen on this to help uh, the indigenous community in our First Nations. Um, both Darren and I, our companies have excellent relationships with the First Nations. And that's because we operate in their communities and we spend far more time than the law requires us to, to help the communities that we work in. And I really emphasize that because when I, when I, when I want to, and our company wants to uh, help those communities, we can only help those communities if, if we have the money to help them. And when our industry flourishes, it gives us more opportunity to provide funds for them for education. It provides us the ability to provide them with jobs, which then in when you have education and when you have jobs, that then uh, builds your self-respect and your integrity and allows you as an individual to flourish as well. So I view the, the ability for us for us to expand our business is also a check mark for us to help the First Nations and very specific indigenous communities because what's good for us is good for them. And as Canadians as a whole, and as all of the stakeholders, and they play a major part in that, uh, it allows us to help them flourish. And we, we hear a, a whole discussion about Canada and, and what our, uh, obligations are to all of our stakeholders and very specifically the First Nations. Well, the development of energy allows us to really help uh, those individuals which we want to help. And we go far beyond doing um, what, what you read about and what other people are trying to accomplish. And it's because we have the opportunity to deal firsthand with these individuals who are wonderful people um and so that that's a, a check mark for that so you see a check mark for esg you see a check mark for um indigenous or first nations um issues and i view them like other stakeholders we, we have to be part of that solution which we are as lng as the development of our industry goes and then the third thing that's that is really shaping up well for, for the strong natural gas producers is our companies control a lot of land. And as commodity prices start to go up because drilling is not uh, going on around us. So uh, my expectation is you're going to see uh, less drilling and companies, both Darren and I have declines, our production declines each year. And so if we don't drill, then there's going to be less production around and you heard darren say he's going to drill enough to run flat which means he's going to keep his production flat and that's the same thing we're going to do so that means there's no new production coming and yet the growth the demand for energy for natural gas has not fallen in uh the covid period of time since last march which is very interesting so that tells you the demand notwithstanding we've had covid and lack of demand natural gas is going to continue to grow. And when it grows, that demand grows, and we don't have new supply coming, that's good for commodity price, which means I'm hopeful that companies that survive, so the Paytos and the Birchcliffs of the world, um, will be able then to expand out our infrastructure. And the difference, what our, our two companies have, I believe that others don't, is when you own that infrastructure 100%, you can determine to build pipelines, you can determine to add to your gas plants, 
and you can flourish with the extra capital that you have versus other companies who, okay, I want to do more drilling, but now I got to go and talk to a third party processor to see if his economics work to expand plants. So, th so that's a huge advantage to us. It's also an advantage for us when we start to look at the development of LNG projects because we control the base infrastructure that we need to feed into an LNG facility. So when you have the gas and you have the costs and you have the, the demand um, or the where the want by by governments to have clean energy, the development of of clean energy, and of the final thing, which to me is so important, is we have what's called the rule of law in our country, and it's very important. It's why we live here. We have a wonderful standard of living, and we need to take our natural gas responsibly produced and sell it to countries um, because we have the rule of law and we have um, responsibly produced energy and we want to displace energy in other places where where other countries are buying energy that's not responsibly produced by countries who do not have a rule of law which we have to wonder why why wouldn't we sell our responsibly produced energy from a country that has um, the rule of law where citizens' rights are important. And if we if we don't develop that and do that, then um, those countries who don't have the rule of law, who don't have civil rights, who don't have responsibly produced energy are going to flourish and we're going to take on debt uh, to, I guess, buy other forms of energy. And I know both Darren and I believe that there's a, an energy package that exists. That's electricity, that's wind, that's solar, that's natural gas. So there's a full package of energy that we have to have. But natural gas has to play a really, really big part of that. And we have to be able to offset um, energy that's not reproduced, re, uh, produced responsibly and get credit for that here when we do that. So I, I think those are my comments on all of that and natural gas fits in all of that. So there's, there's big upside for us here, but we have to be patient. We have to work within the framework that others want us to work in. And then uh, we need the the ability to be to be given the ability to generate uh, growth and that that'll just come with more demand and commodity price so th those are my thoughts on that issue all right thank you so much jeff i think that was really insightful um actually we do have um i think there's a couple of questions uh, i just want to ask the panelists um and i think if Maybe this one is probably more appropriate for, for either, um, I think probably Jeff, if you could address it, is just what do you think as a low cost operator, do you still think there's any opportunity to extract value from the service sector? Um, is that still possible? I think that's one missing piece that we haven't talked about today, um, but maybe something you could probably, if so, you can share so some Dallas, insights. Was your question, can we extract value from the service sector, meaning our companies reduce our costs? Yeah, yeah. So here, here's my view, and I, I'm interested to hear what Pato has to say or Darren has to say, but um, I'm very concerned uh, about the service sector. I believe, and it's no news to anyone, it's been decimated. So, uh, there's two or three things that are really shaping up here. Number one, uh, as Darren said, he's got a big program this year. We have a big program this year in terms of value, um, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars we're going to spend. So uh, we're setting up with the services that we want, and we know they're going to be there. But one of the concerns I have is if we think we're just going to go out and start growing our industry, well, the services aren't there. The people who have work on drilling rigs, I think 16% of the rigs are currently working today, and the frac crews, I don't know what percentage of working, but not many. 
Well, those people who work on with those companies, they're gone. They need they need jobs that provide them with um, constant uh, uh, a constant way to earn a living. They can't work for five months and then sit on the sidelines for six months and be unemployed. So a lot of those people are seeking other employment, and that is setting up for uh, the big companies such as ourselves who have defined drilling programs with certain rigs and thir- certain frac spreads using certain pipeline crews, we're okay. But if somebody thinks they're just going to come in and phone up drilling rigs and think they're going to get hot rigs or phone up frac crews and think that they're going to be available to them, those just don't exist. And so uh, from if you're looking straight from commodity price, that sets up for a big lag time if we think we're going to get growth in our industry because those crews aren't there. So there's going to be a lag time from the decision we make that we want to drill to the time that uh, that new production is actually going to come on because we're not going to take risk on execution. So we're going to want the right crews at the right costs. And that is going to be a barrier to end entry for anyone because the last thing you need is to miss your budgets and not get the resource you think you're going to get. So I believe the service industry will slowly grow back over time, but it's going to create opportunity because that's a lag time for, for supply coming, which means commodity prices got to go up. And uh, the decimation of the service companies um, uh, that plays both ways. It's it's good for commodity price. It's bad for for companies wanting to drill. I don't know, Darren, what you, what do you think of that? No, I'd echo those same comments, Jeff. That we just don't have the service industry to allow the basin to really grow all that much. Um, you know, and we've taken our pound of flesh out of the service companies as much as uh, they had anything to give. Uh, I think today the discussions all revolve around efficiency. They all revolve around collaboration between us and the service companies to try and become more efficient. They revolve around scale, um, trying to do, you know, multiple wells on a single pad site at, a sa- at the same time. You know, all, all of those little gains that we can try and make from an efficiency standpoint, uh, we get the benefit of, and so do the service companies. And like Jeff said, you know, all that's left today are those companies that uh, uh, the stronger gas producers have aligned themselves with. I know for us, you know, we've drilled a thousand horizontals over the last 10 years. Uh, we, we've got a, a rig working for us today that's been working for us for 10 years straight. Uh, so you, you get that kind of service company alignment and you can make some gains, but uh, we want to double the number of rigs we've got. Uh, they just, they aren't out there. Uh, the manpower isn't out there. The frac crews aren't out there. The pipeline crews aren't out there. Uh, and, and people in this industry that work in the service industry have been waiting for work to materialize for the last few years. Obviously, it hasn't. I mean, you just can't wait forever. So those people have gone on to find other careers and other jobs. and. Uh, we're going to have to then build out a brand new service sector. And as Jeff alludes to, that's going to take both time and it's going to take a lot of money that uh, materializes in the form of higher service rates. That's got to be driven by higher commodity prices. Yeah. Got it. Got it. No, that, that's excellent. Uh, and I think we have one more slide uh, and I will probably just finish it up here. Um, and thank you so much, everyone on the panel, uh, to give us a really great insight on what's happening in the market today and what it takes to grow that production, right? And this is last thing is our Wood McKinsey uh, WCSB gas production view. And you can see that for us, we do expect 2020, 2021 production to continue to, in, uh, to, to come into the decline. Something that I think both Darren and Jeff has alluded to, you know, even the low cost producers are just maintaining their production. Uh, and now looking for growth, and it's going to be even harder for some of the higher cost for, uh, producers. But we do think, you know, gas prices are going to increase uh, as a response to that. And we think, you know, by 2022 and beyond, there will be enough price signals for the basin to resume some of the growth. In the long term, we do think, you know, there are four basins in our North American gas markets to see growth, WCSB, Permian, Northeast, and Haynesville. So, you know, as much as we talk about some of the difficulties we're seeing in Western Canada, if you're looking at Rockies, you know, that's definitely, or the Mekong, you know, those are definitely regions that are even seeing more 
challenges um, to to um, to see production growth. And you know, at the end of the day, uh, WCSB Western Canada, we are blessed with a lot of the low cost resources that can compete into the the North American gas markets in terms of the um, the exports. So um, let me just check to see. I think there's one more question that's come in through Sean. Um, except I can't find it Dale. so i don't know if if there's a way that you can paste the questions in but i think we have one more question that came in uh, there we go you, i think in the fracking oh uh, i think this is an open-ended question i think it's, it's actually pretty interesting so maybe jeff i'll start with you because i think this yep, it's fracking uh what what happens if biden wins the election is this something that you think could change things for for western canada so i'm uh first of all i watched the uh uh i think that was the debate last night i'm not sure but i did watch it all and uh, it was quite interesting so uh if biden wins then then there is some discussion on whether or not uh, he's going to stop all fracking on federal lands and obviously uh, Devin thinks that he, he's going to do that because they did a large transaction this week where the net of it was they helped, helped WPX, a company with more debt than you might want to have, but whose lands aren't on uh, federal lands. And I think it was 60% of Devin's lands are on federal lands. So that would tell you that people are concerned about it. So that's good news for Western Canada. That's good news for Alberta because uh, if they can't develop those lands, I don't know where gas supply is going to come from. And uh, you mentioned the Permian Basin and their drilling, and the math we would do would say they've got to have a lot higher than $40 oil before they're going to fire up rigs. So those two things, low oil prices and Biden getting elected, would would be very good news for the Western Canadian producer would be my view. I'd like to hear from the others, though. Anybody care to jump in? Come on, Darren. I know you want to answer the question. <laughs> I'll, I'll give da I'll uh, give think... Darren a minute. I'll give Darren a minute to think. Uh, I'm uh, I tend to be pretty cynical about these these pronouncements of uh, of of what they're going to do uh, with regard to stopping fracking and things like that. I mean, it's it, it is I guess it's highly questionable. I mean, obviously, Biden is is. Uh, uh, reliant upon union support and other things like that. And there are certainly lots of people uh, that are very interested, I think, in the United States in, in seeing fracking and uh, gas production continue. So whether or not he feels he can follow through on this, I mean, if you, I listened to part of the debate last night. Uh, Jeff, you've got a far stronger stomach than I do, I think. But uh, <laughs> No, I had nothing else to do. Oh, okay. But I mean, uh, you know, the, these guys can't do what they're saying they're going to do. It's a little hard to tell what they're saying they're going to do sometimes because they're usually just saying what the other guy can't do. But, but uh, you know, there's so many promises. I, I, I'm skeptical that that one's going to be followed through on by Biden if he gets elected. But uh, who knows? Lots of uncertainty, at least. Yeah, I'd add to that, Brad, that... Um you know, voters and ultimately the consumers are going to dictate whether they're going to accept that kind of dramatic change in energy uh, policy. Uh, we're seeing it transpire a little bit in California right now where, you know, a dramatic change in energy policy is translating into a significant impact to both voters and consumers of energy. And we're going to see whether that plays out with an acceptance by Californians that they're willing to have blackouts and willing to have no access to the energy that they've traditionally had at their fingertips, uh, or uh, are they not willing to accept that? And they're going to then vote out different gov vote different government into power that's going to change that. So, you know, I think um, that's what it's going to boil down to. Governments imposing their will or certain certain political uh, stripes imposing their will upon the consumers, and those consumers have to then ultimately choose whether they're willing to accept that or not. Perfect. And I think we're over, way over time. Um, so um, thank you very much, everybody, for, for joining the call. Uh, and thank you for all the panelists for great insights today. Um, and if you have any questions, please follow up with Dale uh, and 
have a great day. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Dol. Thanks, Dulles. Thanks, Darren, Brad, Dan, and Jeff. Uh, I have to agree with Jeff in certain respects. I watched a little bit of the debate last night, and it looked like something out of America's Got Talent or The Voice or something like that. It was just, it was a gong show. Um, and from now until November, it's just going to be more of the same. Uh, we can't forget also that we have some of the same political issues up here uh, to deal with, whether we'll have the opportunity to uh, be proactive in dealing with it or not uh, in the near term, only time will tell. Uh, again, viewers for attending today's session, I'd like to remind you again of the next session on Monday, uh, also at 11 a.m. Mountain Time, when we're going to look a little bit more closely at probably one of the bigger success stories in the Canadian oil and gas industry lately, and that's uh, the whole question of managing methane. Uh, we have very quickly become a world leader in reducing methane, uh, not only from flaring, but also from, uh, from fugitive emissions virtually across the gas value chain. And that's something that uh, LNG projects like uh, LNG Canada and Wood Fiber on the West Coast are counting on and promoting in their uh, green LNG uh, strategies. Again, thanks very much, and we'll see you next week.